Okay, so quite some time ago, I made a tutorial series about how to make a turn-based combat system in Unity 4. However, now that Unity is up to 5, a few things have changed and are actually easier, which is the way you'd hope it would work. And I figured I'd make something slightly more advanced. It will still be 2D, but in the previous version that I made, it was basically in line with, say, the original Shining Force, where one character on the screen, one enemy on the screen, uh, no idle animations, and the attack animations for the most part was a single frame. At least the character animation was a single frame, but then the spell itself would be animated. So I wanted to do something a little bit more advanced. So there'll be multiple characters on the screen, multiple enemies on the screen. They will all have idle animations, and they'll all have attack animations. So it's going to be more like uh, a kind of an advanced RPG maker. I personally don't use RPG Maker. I've seen some of the videos, um, so I'm not quite sure about the entire uh, range of what of what it can do. But it seems to be more in line with that. So multiple players, multiple enemies, animations, that kind of thing. So let's get right into it. So as you can see, there's nothing here. It's just the main camera. This is what you have when you create a new 2D project. As far as the assets down here, you do, there's no complicated uh, import process. You simply open up a folder um, and you just drag and drop the images from that folder. So you've drawn images in an external program. They're saved in a folder. You just drag and drop those images into the asset area. So let's take a look at one of them. So this is going to be our background. Now, if you notice here, pixels per unit, this defaults to 100. Okay, so when you first import an image, it will be at 100. So I'm clicking on a few others. You can see it's 100, it's 100, it's 100. So why was this 170? Well, that's because let's take a look what happens when we put this into our scene. So to add something to your scene, you just drag and drop it into the hierarchy. And there you go. So here's our background image. This rectangle shows you the point of view of the camera, which means there would be this up and lower blank space. So if you click on the main camera down here, see you got all that blank space and we don't want that. So there's two ways to resolve that. One, you can scale the image itself because an object has multiple components. This one has a transform component and a sprite renderer. The sprite renderer displays the image that we just selected. Does a few other things as well. The transform is what gives the object a position in the scene, you can rotate the object and you can scale the object. So you could scale this, say, uh, X, say, to 2 and Y to 2. You could do something like that. But for purposes of this demonstration, I want to show you something else. So we're going to click on the asset itself, and there's the pixels per unit. Since this is a ratio, if it, you make it smaller, the object gets bigger. Unity used something known as Unity Units. It's a, it's a uh, measure of distance. And so what you're saying is that the pixels per Unity unit is less. Therefore, it's making the object bigger. D not going to worry too much about Unity Units in this. It's kind of there. You don't have to worry about it too much. But anyway, so by changing that ratio to a small number, as you can see, this got bigger. Now you could say, well, isn't this image too big? And my answer would be no. And the reason for that is because you want your project to be able to scale. Now, if you're doing a very small project, so be it. But if you have ambitions to make your project grow over time, then that means you have to have the project be developed in such a way that it's scalable. So for instance, if your image is exactly the size of your screen, what if you want to do, say, like an earthquake effect? and have the screen shake, you really need an image larger than the screen or else again you'd get the black bars at the top and the bottom. Likewise, maybe what you want to do is you want to see the characters running, this scrolls, and then the enemy appears here. Well, you can't do that if, again, if the image is exactly the same size as the screen. So plan ahead. If you, if you want to be able to give yourself some room to grow, uh, you got to kind of think long term like that, that you don't make something exactly the specifications that you need. 
that you might actually be able to give yourself, uh, like I said, room to grow by, by making the image bigger than what you actually need. It gives you options. So we have a background. That easy. So let's start making some characters. So how do we create an animated, animated character? Well, you can go up to Game Object. You can go to Create Empty. Let's call this one Witch. So we want to click on Witch. If you don't have all these tabs up here, you can just right click and choose Add Tab. So I'm going to click on Animation. And you get this notice. To begin animating Witch, because that's what's selected, create an animator and animated clip. I was very happy the first time that I saw this because I don't know about anyone else, but in Unity 4, I had this odd glitch where I'd click on an object, I'd go to animation, and yet the animation would be attached to a different object than the one I actually selected. So by seeing this message, it's confirming that it's going to be added to which. So let's go ahead and click on create. Brief note about uh, file naming and having a naming convention. If you notice, I'm not putting the name of the object first. I'm putting the name of uh, really what the animation is. It's the idle animation. Why? Because as your project gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you may find that you want to sort based on certain types of animation. So you may actually want to have all the idle animations together for whatever reason. So uh, come up with a naming system that makes sense to you, but it's important to come up with an actual naming system. Don't just kind of wing it. Trust me, as this gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you're going to want to be able to find your files and know exactly which ones do what. So we'll do save. And here's the timeline. So this is showing you uh, the frames and, and time across the top. And this is the frame rate. So it starts at 60, so, one frame, uh, so 60 frames per second. So we're going to drop that down to like 15. It's not exact. When I drew these uh, animations in an external program, I really didn't have a specific frame rate in mind. So there's definitely uh, room in here for variance. So click on the first frame, hold shift, click on the last frame. It highlights them all and just drag and drop them. And just like that, you now have an animation. Problem is the animation goes out, but we want it to cycle back. So to give us a, a little bit more room here, you can scroll at the bottom or if you use the zoom wheel, as you can see, it squeezes it in and gives you some more space. So as to not lose track of which one you're using, I recommend clicking and then dragging. Now we don't need the last one, again, because the last one's already there. So click, drag, click, drag, click, drag. And we don't need to repeat the first frame because what happens is when this animation finishes playing, it comes all the way back to the beginning. So if the last frame is the second frame, therefore, when it goes back here, it then goes to the first frame. Click on the little record to stop it, go to scene, and you don't see the witch. Reason for that is even though there's an animation sequence, it doesn't play in the uh, development window. If you want a placeholder to, to see, so you can help, so you can get a sense of the size, you can just take one of the images and drag it onto Sprite. Now you can see she's too small. So before we even look to see it, the animation looks good. Let's bring this to say, uh, let's make a scale of two and two. Makes her kind of big, but that's all right. If you have this tool selected, you'll see these arrows. So this just lets you easily move the character around. And if you notice, here in the transform, you'll see X and Y change. So X and Y. And now let's run it. Actually, we're going to do one thing first. Every object has an order in the layer. At least sprites do. Um, most objects do. 
Ordinal layered is just that, which object will be on top. Well, you want the background to be the bottom, so it's at zero. But all objects default with a zero order in the layer. So for the which, let's put her at like three. That way maybe there's something in between the players and the background. Maybe there's some effect. Like maybe there's like a, a fog effect. You want it to be in front of the background but behind the player. So again, kind of think ahead and give yourself a little room to breathe in case you want to do um, additional uh, expansions, uh, additional effects. But this isn't etched in stone. You can always come back and change this. And for a simple program like this, it's not a big deal. But larger programs, you're going to really want to plan that out. All right, so just like that, we have a character. Now, they're not playable, but they will be animated. So you can see their kind of hat in here, and their dress is blowing in the wind. Now, they're not bobbing up and down, okay? I didn't do that in the program. That type of lateral or vertical animation where the character themselves really isn't changing, it's really just their position, you can always do that after the, after the fact. You can do that with coding. Um, so coding won't let you like change her hair or her hat, but the coding, you can have them kind of like just bob up and down, float up and down, and that's how we'll take care of that in a later lesson. So just like that, you create an animated character. Let's do it again because you learn through repetition. Game object, create object. This one we're going to name Suit because she's wearing a suit. Click on Suit. We click on Animation. Same thing. To begin animating Suit. Idle Suit. So now we've got two in a row. So it's not a lot, but as you can see, as you get more and more animation sequences, you're really going to want to be able to identify what does what in here. Again, we're going to drop this down to like 15. Click on the first frame, hold shift, click on the last frame, drag and drop, and then add the frame so it becomes a full cycle. Now it's possible that you're going to come up with an animation sequence that doesn't require this, that the beginning meets the end but in a different manner that that the last frame is unique whereas the next last frame is not unique that is just cycling back but by doing this you save a lot of memory because you get all these extra frames with the with negli negligible additional memory cost or drawing cost for that matter all right so we stop there do the same thing click on suit drag and drop one as a placeholder We'll also scale her out to two by two. Also put her at three. Now, if you find that you're going to have overlap between the characters, like she's going to be in front of her like that, then you'd actually want to put her at a higher order in the layer to guarantee that she's in front. And if you had another person in front of her, you'd want to put her in a higher order in the layer. So she'd be three, she'd be four, the next one would be five. We're not going to do that. We're just going to do two. Because now that you've seen two, you could do three, four, five, six. You've seen the process twice now, and it's just rinse and repeat. Let's run this again. So not really high-end animation, not even close. But it doesn't matter. When you make your project, you're going to have your animation. So it doesn't really matter how mine look. It's the functionality. Me showing you how to do this. Okay, so now let's add an enemy. And the process is basically identical. Game object. Create empty. Call this pumpkin. Click on animation. Similar message to begin animating pumpkin. Create. Idle pumpkin. Change this to 15. Select the frames. Drag and drop. And then just click and drag and drop in reverse order. So again, you have a complete cycle.
okay. Take a single frame to the sprite. Click on this tool, slide them over, and we'll put them order and layer as three, so the same order as the players. There's probably going to actually be very little interaction because most of the exchanges will probably just be um, uh, particle effects. Uh, there will be ranged attacks, that kind of thing. So it doesn't matter too much if these guys are in the same order um, in the layer or not. It's really as long as they're above the background. And let's run this. And that should do it. So now you have two animated characters, an animated enemy. Now, I mentioned having multiple enemies. What we're going to do is for now we're going to have just one enemy. But there's a really neat thing that you can do in Unity, and that is you can basically copy an object. You can turn it to what's known as a prefab, and then you can spawn it. The technical term is instantiate, but you've probably heard the term spawn. And then what you can do is once you've created the one monster, having 10 more takes almost no additional coding. It's so easy to then duplicate that enemy just to use it over and over again. So uh, to me, it doesn't make any sense to create a second enemy when I know going forward what I'm actually going to do is once I've created one enemy, I'm just going to duplicate it. I'm just going to instantiate it. I'm just going to spawn it. So you, we'll get to that in a couple videos. Obviously, we really haven't done any controllable functionality yet. This is purely the kind of passive functionality as far as you're seeing them on the screen. They have position, they have animation, uh, there's no actual player control yet. We're going to start that in the next video. So I think that should do it for this first one.